as everybody has a chance to come in. There's so many people here. I'm so excited. Thank you for spending your Friday with us. Oh, wow. I know. <laughs> Almost 200 right. Wow. <laughs> we'll get started and then we'll let everyone else come in as they do. Um, but hello everyone, happy Chinese New Year, happy almost Valentine's Day. My name is Brittany Kerfoot, the Director of Events at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I would like to welcome you all to this event. I first want to thank our partners at Books and Books in Miami for joining forces with us for this discussion. And I want to thank all of you for attending and supporting independent bookstores like ours. It is so important to us now more than ever, and we're just so grateful that you're here. A couple of housekeeping items to go over before we start things off. First, I will be dropping links in the chat very shortly where you can purchase a copy of Kink which I have right here from either PNP or Books and Books. Um, and I also just heard that the book is already going into its second printing, which is insane because it hasn't even been out a week. So if you want a copy, you better get it soon because they're probably gonna sell out before that second printing hits. So grab your copy soon. Um, also, if you want to ask any of our authors a question tonight, if you could enter it into the Q&A space, and you can find that if you just hover over the bottom bar of the Zoom screen, um, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can in the later part of tonight's event. All right, it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. First, Aro Kwan is the author of the nationally best-selling novel, The Incendiaries, and the co-editor of Kink, a groundbreaking anthology of literary short fiction, exploring love and desire, BDSM, and interests across the sexual spectrum, featuring a roster of all-star contributors. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Paris Review, NPR, and lots of other places. Next, Garth Greenwell is the other co-editor of Kink and the author most recently of Cleanness, the highly anticipated follow-up to his beloved debut, What Belongs to You, that deepens his exploration of foreignness, obligation, and desire. Carmen Maria Machado is the author of the best-selling memoir, In the Dream House, and the award-winning short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties. She is the Abrams Artist in Residence at the University of Pennsylvania, and her short story, The Last Performance of the High Priestess of the Temple of Horror, appears in this collection. And last but not least, Alexander Chi, author of the novels Edinburgh and The Queen of the Night, and the essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel. He is a contributing editor at the New Republic and an editor at large at VQR. He teaches creative writing at Dartmouth College, and his story, Best Friendster Date Ever, is included in Kink as well. So please help me welcome all of these superstar writers onto your screens. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm so excited. Um, I want to start out so that everyone can kind of get a flavor of the book by having you guys each do a quick reading of the story that you have included in the collection. Um, so Reese, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you, politi Politics and Prose. Thank you to Books and Books. Um, thank you to Carmen and Alex, and of course, to my wonderful co-editor, Garth. We've been working on this book since 2017, and it's just such a joy to, um, to see it come to life. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna read from a story called Safe Word, um, and it begins with a couple, Paul and Chion, going to an appointment with a dominatrix um, in her dungeon. And then so Paul is like remembering what came before this. So much was his fault. Like a jackass, he'd pushed her and pushed her. A month ago, he'd interrupted the back massage he was giving her. Harder, she kept saying, to ask if there was anything else she wanted to try in bed. Chion, Paul said after a moment. It was possible she was asleep, but it was even more possible she was pretending this wasn't happening. They were like two thirds of a bar joke. He was an ex-Pentecostal, she was an ex-Catholic, and though she'd been with him for three years, she still refused to let him in the bathroom as she was so much as taking a piss. Chion, he repeated, running a knuckle up the long knobbed curve of her neck. He was straddling her. She was lying on her stomach in her bra and panties. No, I'm fine, she said. Thank you though. Really, there's nothing, he said. Come on, there must be some fantasy you've never told me about. There's not even one other thing you wanna try. He brought this up as a joke mostly, and also of course, because he kind of wanted her to ask him what other fantasies he had, 
But now that she was being so evasive, he had to wonder, was she lying? She twisted her neck to look up at him. Paul, she said too gently, are you bored? No, he said. Quickly, before she had time to think, he said, but you are. Then came the denials, the expostulations, the what the hell are you talking about? And then, if only to prove him wrong, she pulled off his boxers and bounced on top of him for a long athletic display of just how bored she was not. But after she'd fallen asleep, her head huddled under his chin, he lay awake wondering. A year married, three together. Say they had sex every three days on average. Once every three days, 121.7 fucks a year. So 365 times they played hide the salami, the same stick in the same hole, the stick in the hole, the stick in the hole, the stick in the, who wouldn't feel bored? The fact that he hadn't yet meant nothing. He was an outlier. Recently, he'd eaten the same lomito every weekday for a month from the Chilean sandwich place next to his office because it was good. Tasty, filling, reliable. Why mess around? Maybe he should make the straightforward effort and believe his wife when she said she was fine. But now that he was thinking about it, he couldn't, not really. She was so kind to him that she couldn't be trusted. Over the next couple of weeks, he brought up the question every now and then, teasing her. And though she brushed him off each time, he shouldn't have been as surprised as he was when one night she shook him awake. It couldn't have taken long. He slept lightly, fearfully, because anything could happen. He opened his eyes and Chion was sitting cross-legged, her hands folded in her lap. Fine, she said, if you really have to know. I think it's gone, but it comes back. What, he said, thinking she'd had a bad dream. It was only when he reached for her hands, her palms damp and electric, that he realized she was crying. Jian, what is it? What comes back? There's something a little wrong with me, she said, each word enunciated, as if she were reciting a speech. You're going to hate this. Sometimes I really need you to hurt me. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's a great place to end. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I think my favorite part of that is hide the salami. That's just classic. <laughs> Um, okay, Garth, since you are the other co-editor, let's move on to your story. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to say it is, so it's rare to do a group reading where literally all of the participants are among the people I love best in the whole world. And it is such a joy um, just to see your all's faces. So thank you guys for being here for the reading. And thanks to everybody in the audience for um, being here with us. So I'm just going to read one paragraph of my story. It's very short. Um, the story is called Gospodar, uh, which is the Bulgarian word for master or lord. And um, you need to know that the narrator is an American um, living and working in Sofia, Bulgaria. And he's gone to meet a man, an older man, for the first time in this man's apartment. They've chatted online. And he knows he's in for a quite intense, quite rough encounter. And you need to know one word of Bulgarian, um, which is the word kuchko, which means bitch. It's an exact equivalent. It means female dog. But there's a twist, um, a nuance of Bulgarian is that it has a vocative case, which means the form of a word changes if it is a direct address to someone. And something about that change allows this word of abuse to become tender between them, something almost like an endearment. He let go of my hair then, freeing his hand to move down the side of my face, almost stroking it before he cupped it in his palm. It was a tender gesture and his voice was tender too as he said, Kuchko, addressing me as if solicitously and tilting my head so that we gazed at each other face to face. His fingers flexed against my cheek, almost in a caress. I leaned my head into him, resting it on his palm as he spoke again in that tone of tenderness or solicitude. Tell me, Kuchko, tell me what you want. And I did tell him, at first slowly and with the usual words, reciting the script that both does and does not express my desires. And then I spoke more quickly and more searchingly, drawn forward by the tone of his voice, what seemed like tenderness, although it was not tenderness, until I found myself suddenly in some recess or depth where I had never been. There were things I could say in his language because I spoke it poorly, without self-consciousness or shame, 
as if there were something in me unreachable in my own language, something I could reach only with that blunter instrument by which I too was made a blunter instrument. And I found myself at last at the, strain, at the end of my strange litany saying again and again, I want to be nothing. I want to be nothing. Good, the man said, good speaking with the same tenderness and smiling a little as he cupped my face in his palm and bent forward, bringing his own face to mine as if to kiss me, I thought, which surprised me, though I would have welcomed it. Good, he said a third time, his hand letting go of my cheek and taking hold of my hair again, forcing my neck farther back. And then suddenly, and with great force, he spat into my face. Thank you. Wow. Uh, Carmen, would you like to go next? I shall, thank you. Um, I am reading from my story, The Lost Performance of the High Priestess of the Temple of Horror, um, which uh, appears in print for the first time in this book. Um, all you really need to know is the, the protagonist is a young woman who has sort of run away to the Grand Guignol, this um, French uh, theater, a naturalistic horror theater in Paris that existed from the late 19th century into the 1960s. Um, and she has fallen into love and lust with this woman, Moxa, who is an actress many years her senior. After I'd helped Moxa prepare for the night's performance, I was allowed to sit in the audience, though not occupy a paying chair. I thought I would become tired or bored of the same rotating sets of plays every night, but I could not stop watching Moxa. She exhibited control over every twitch. She never laughed when she might have laughed, never put a crack in the tension. Every night, Moxa screamed on stage. Her scream was a magnificent thing, a resonating animal that climbed out of her throat and gambled about the room. Some nights, if the room was particularly hot, I swore I could see the ribbons of her voice emanating from her. She screamed as she was raped and strangled, disemboweled, stabbed. She screamed as she was consumed by wild cats, shot in the gut, shot in the head, here accompanied by an uncanny whistling sound as if the scream were coming from the newly created orifice. She screamed as she was beaten, lit on fire, Audience members would stagger into the street to vomit, and at the end of the night, the cobblestone street was studded with glistening puddles. There were always a few doctors in the audience, sitting at the end of their rows. They were necessary, as fainting of audience members was a regular occurrence. Mostly men, which caused a great deal of snickering and speculation among us. The prevailing theory for this fact was that women were always afraid and covering their eyes and the men watched what they could not and then found themselves unable to bear it. But Moxa knew the truth and told me the reason for the fainting. Most men, she said, would only see bodily fluids when they caught their ejaculate in their hands or if their life ended at the wrong end of a brawl. But for women, gore was a unit of measurement, monthly cycles, the egg white slip of arousal, the blood of virginity stolen through force of hand or the force of law, childbirth, fists splitting the skin of the skull, the leak of milk, tears. I once saw a woman in the street who had been knocked about by a lover or perhaps a customer. Her eye socket looked crushed. The new shape of her head made my stomach curdle. She was weeping, but the salt tears were pink. She wiped them from her filthy face and looked at them on her hand, the color of a rare diamond. Even my tears bleed, she said, and staggered down the street. Men occupy terra firma because they are like stones. Women seep because, seep because they occupy the filmy gauze between the world of the living and the dead, Moxa said. She was always saying stuff like that. But after watching her perform every night, I began to believe it. Thank you. That selection is so visceral. I can like see everything so perfectly. Um, all right, Alex, you're up. Hello. So nice to be here with everybody. Favorite people, favorite bookstores. Um, 
I have never read this story out loud. So. Uh, even though I wrote it in 2006. Anyway, <clears throat> which you can tell from the title, Best Friendster Date Ever. So. I found him on Friendster, the first of what would be many giant electronic yearbooks for the never ending high school that is life in the United States. On the outside chance you've no idea what I'm talking about, you join the site, link your profile page to your friends' pages, and soon you could follow a network out to, in my case, then 156,550 people. My life felt smaller than that, though. I was living in Koreatown in Los Angeles in a sublet with friends in a 4,000 square foot, five bedroom apartment where we could be home and never see each other. One was an old friend, the other two were his friends who were now my friends. The building looked so much like a New York building it was constantly used for location shots. In 2004, Los Angeles, people took the internet really seriously. Most people I met had a blog and my first summer there was the first time I was ever getting hit on over the internet. I decided to hit back. It hadn't been a very romantic or sexual summer. The best I'd done live and in person was get blind drunk at a West Hollywood bar on vodka and Red Bull like a sorority girl, buying someone a rose off of one of those people that wander through bars with buckets of roses. Said recipient was said to be charmed, a friend of friends, on Friendster even, with some fairly amazing naked pictures of himself on his Friendster page. My birthday was coming up, I was single again, and while it was too gruesome to contemplate writing to the man from my blackout, I began paging through the pages and pages of strangers with their brightly colored snapshots and their witty or not so witty profile one-liners until I saw this one. I sent him a very casual note and said something corny and low key. This is just a fan letter to say you're hot. To my amazement, he wrote back, he was 12 years younger than me, just out of college in New York, but he was smart, a California Rambo, skinny and perhaps tall in the photos. He agreed to meet me while I was celebrating my birthday at the Silver Lake Summer Street Fair. Sounds like my kind of tragedy, he wrote. Fair enough, I thought. We exchanged numbers and I was excited, but on the day of, he became a little hard to find. We kept missing each other. By the time I met him, I was annoyed by seven missed calls and not particularly interested. I finally found him across from an enormous moonwalk. In person, he was a little taller than me, probably about 6'1", dressed like the sort of boys I used to meet back in New York. From his appearance, I was fairly sure there was an ex he wasn't over, that he read The Economist and had intimacy issues, especially after I noticed his glasses and rock climbing shorts. I was about to give him the brush off, but there was a flash of something in his eye that caught me, a fishhook notion. It should be said his skin was a miracle of smoothness to look at. He had the kind of perfect, slightly gold skin of some blondes. I had friends with me, my roommates. He had friends with him. They were watching us too intently. I said, let's go get a beer. And we walked away from the mall. The street fair had seemed like a good idea for my birthday in theory. But now that I was here, I found the bands dull, the people uninteresting, the goods for sale and appealing. It was like the ugly stepchild of a really cool street fair somewhere else in time and place, just not here. Friends in question, my three roommates, Peter, David, and Leon, had spoken to me about how I'd not gotten laid that summer in a kind of emergency conference before this. <clears throat> With wicked smiles, they tossed a paper bag on the table between us. I pulled out the contents as they sang the happy birthday song. Lube, single portion size, rubbers, restraints, made of nylon with clasp from a backpack, and Velcro, a few porno mags. Absurd enough to make it sexy. I laughed. It was a fairly direct editorial comment. I looked at their Velcro snaps and plastic hooks, perfect for hiking and tying up vegetarians, waterproof. Thanks, I said, as they cheered. They laughed and pinched my cheeks like aunties, blew kisses at both of us and then removed themselves to another table. My date reached over for the restraints. He tentatively put the one on his wrist. Huh, he said. He seemed blankly quizzical and I wondered what was going through his mind. I didn't know him well enough to know if he was hard to read. 
all I was thinking was the real bottoms, you don't actually have to tie them up. Stop there. <laughs> You made me do a spit take on that one. <laughs> she was drinking her water just as you were done. Um, thank you guys so much. And for those who don't know, I should mention that there are so many other superstar writers in this collection as well. There's Brandon Taylor and Melissa Phoebos and Roxanne Gay and Larissa Pham. I mean, the list goes on. So this collection is, is just absolutely incredible. Um, and there's so much I want to talk about. I, I wish this event were like three hours. Um, if you guys have questions for any of them, please put them in the Q&A space um, and we'll get to those soon. But I want to start with, um, there's a New York Times review of the book, Jasmine Hughes, and the title was Kink is Not About Sex. It's a book about, well, kink. So, what is kink and how is it different from like romance, erotica, um, just books about sex? I mean, how do you guys define kink if you even can? Well, I mean, I, oh, sorry, Reese, go ahead, you. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> For the horrible awkwardness. Um, so I, I, I'll say that, you know, as the editors, you know, Reese and I made a conscious decision that we talked about from the very beginning that we were not going to define kink and that we did not want this anthology to be about drawing lines or like forming some club that we were going to decide if people were in or out of. We asked writers to um, offer us stories that they felt in some significant way centered kink, whatever that meant to them. So, you know, in my own thinking about kink, I mean, and I'll be so interested to hear um, what Alex and Carmen especially have to say, because I feel like Reese and I've talked about this a lot, but um, you know, uh, I'm very uncomfortable with any of the sort of conceptual categories I feel that I have at my fingertips to talk about kink. So if I begin to say non-normative, non-traditional sexual, like I'm already falling into categories and paradigms that I reject. What I am comfortable saying is that it seems to me that kink very often um, foregrounds theatricality, staging, negotiation, that there is a way in which kink practices and kink communities don't take for granted what sex is. There isn't a kind of received notion of what sex looks like. Instead, sex is a creative act that one, um, you know, forms with another person. And so those, that does seem to me fair to say, or I'm comfortable with that as a kind of general characterization, but I never want to be in the state of telling someone else um, how they should think about their own erotic lives or whether or not, you know, they get to be in our club, I guess. Yeah, very much what Garth said. And I would, um, I would only add that I think especially with an anthology, which in so many ways, um, it's just very different than writing a novel, of course. Um, it's, it's much more of a collective project. It felt much more like a project for our communities. Um, and in light of, and with, with an anthology, like we just, we felt that any definition coming from us as the editors would, would, would have to be, we would be imposing something. We would be imposing a definition on other people. And we really, really didn't want to do that. Um, so that was really why it was important to us to not define kink, at least inside the book. I, I'm really hard pressed to like add to what I feel like is Garth's like perfect, beautiful description of kink, which I feel like is very all encompassing. But I, I did want to add that for me, this story was, it was so funny because we were just talking before the event started about like how this book has been many years in the making. And I remember back when you guys first reached out to me, I was like, you know, weirdly I am like, you, you know, I was like, I was like, I it never would have occurred to me to write a story about kink, but weirdly at the moment you emailed me, I was writing this story and this story was many new things for me. Like it was the first time I'd ever really explicitly written about race. It was the first time I'd ever explicitly written anything about, um, uh, uh, with a historical, like that required research that had like a lot of a historical component and also was the first time that I'd ever written about kink. And so I feel like for me, there was this sort of process of this unfolding of understanding and this willingness to like enter into new spaces um, that came with both like my, in my own life and also was coming, was like, was like me writing, writing this, this story as well, um, which is not nearly as like <laughs> articulate, but there's just something about like a, like a, like a newness and a, de and a depth that I think 
and like the process of like moving from one space to the other that also feels very like queer in its own way to me um and like feels similar to like how it was when I was beginning to understand myself as a, as a queer person and then I feel like there's there's sort of this other layer, level to it so yeah I uh would add to that I guess um to me kink is about in some ways uh re-meeting yourself through uh, these um, ideas or experiences um, that provide pleasure that is unexpected, maybe unaccounted for, um, that uh, it may or may not be frowned on, but it may also exist outside of the imagination of the frowners. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of like, uh, uh, the people who like, um, who just like to watch videos of people eating, for example, and that's their kink. Or like uh, this guy I found who just, he just sits on cakes, nude or in uh, a, a thong. That's like, that's his whole thing that <laughs> people pay for his only fans like like crazy to watch it and uh i wouldn't have thought that was my kink i'm not sure that it is but i love that it exists you know like when i when i sampled it i did not know what was going to happen i just was curious i was like what is, what is that oh that's what that is and i think that's um it does it's so funny because i think so often it's thought of as being a kind of being so much about sex per se, but it is, it's about expanding the idea of the erotic out past the boundaries of sex into all these other imaginative realms. So that's what I think of as, that's how I think of kink. And I love that you guys talk about it and write about it so non-judgmentally. I feel like our society has a penchant for shaming things we don't understand or labeling them as um, crazy or evil or a disorder. Um, Risa, I know you wrote a piece in The Guardian um, where you cite that up until very recently, like within the last decade, certain varieties of kink were classified as disorders. Um, and I feel like kink has such a stigma around it. It's still considered either taboo or people joke about it. Um, or, you know, when we think of something like a fetish, it's got these sinister undertones to it in a lot of pieces are, of our pop culture. Um, and so I wonder if by contributing to this collection, you guys wanted to address that um, and kind of destigmatize the whole idea of kink. Um, well, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it from an editorial point of view. Um, we, we, Garth and I were, I think, well, kink jumped in my, from my, from what I've seen, kink jumped kind of really fast from being um, taboo to being a joke. Um, and in a lot of ways, um, I think I, I wanted to, I wanted us, I wanted a book that would, that would bring us back to human beings, you know, bring us back to people, bring it back to people engaging with their bodies, engaging with other people and their bodies. Um, and so that was a big project of it. And yeah, there are so many flattening, there's so many ways in which kinky people and kink um, are flattened and, um, and caricatured in, in a lot of especially popular culture. Um, so much so that at this point, when there's a serial killer on a TV, on, like if a serial killer shows up on a TV show, I count, I, I, I like make a bet with myself, how many minutes until we find out that this asshole is also kinky. And it's just like, there aren't that many serial killers, you know? And there are like so many kinky people, like where does this come from? It's so ridiculous. Anyway, <laughs> we wanted to move past like serial killers and, uh, oh, and emotionally stunted billionaires. That's the other one, go ahead. <laughs> um, I, so I, I had this interesting experience where I, I so I published a, a memoir about queer domestic violence a couple of years ago now. And one of the things I found when I was doing research for this book was I was, I was researching sort of the conversation about queer, like les, domestic violence and lesbian communities from like the eighties and nineties. And the thing I kept running into that was very strange was like articles about, about 
abused. I mean, like we need to like, you know, talk about this. And then they would say, but also, you know, there are people who beat other people and they think it's sexy, but like, it's also part of the abuse. And there would be like ads in lesbian periodicals that would be like lesbian picnic, no abusers and no sadomasochists. And that would just be like on, like in an ad, like, you know, and so there was also this like weird conversation where like BDSM and abuse were sort of being conflated and confused. And it was interesting because when I was writing this story, like the relationship between Moxa and the protagonist is not healthy. Like it's not good. It's very sexually formative. Like it ends up being very important to the protagonist, but it's not a good relationship, but she actually, like it was important to me that she like goes through the whole arc of that relationship. It's not good. And then when she gets out of it, she like finds someone else who like is also engaging in this with her, but like respects her as a person. Um, And so, it was important to me to like articulate that like like those things those things are not necessarily like that like they don't go together they don't go together like you know you can have like a bad relationship that also includes BDSM but like those things are actually separate from each other um and you can sort of take it and <laughs> take it somewhere else um so yeah that was for, that was sort of a thing that was on my mind when I was when I was writing this, my story no, I'm glad you brought that up because as I was reading it consent plays a huge role in a lot of your stories um and we see how an encounter, and like Garth, I'm <clears throat> specifically thinking of your story, how an encounter can turn violent and scary very quickly. Um, and this is within and outside of the kink community, right? Um, but people in the kink community, I feel like have to t- talk about consent in a very different way, um, maybe be more explicit about it. Um, consent comes down to more than just a yes or no in a lot of different kink varieties. Um, and so I would love for you to talk about that and how important that dialogue is around consent specifically within um, the theme of kink. Yeah, so I, I mean, I do think um, this is something that Um, is a real gift I think kink communities can offer the larger culture, which is a familiarity with, a comfort with, a foregrounding of conversations about consent and understanding that conversations about consent can be themselves sexy, can be part of sex, um, can be part of intimacy. Um, You know, as a culture, we are struggling with our inability to talk about consent. And so it does seem to me that that's a real gift. You know, it is true, and, and I wanted in writing about um, BDSM, you know, I, because I, I do think that um, thinking about shame, which kink does not always have to do with shame, but sometimes it does have to do with shame. And it seems to me that, you know, part of the extraordinary potential of kink practices is that they can function as a kind of technology that can transform shame from something that is simply a kind of something that, you know, afflicts us into something that we can use that can be productive of pleasure or of sociality, of intimacy, of beauty, of community. Um, Sometimes that technology works and sometimes it doesn't. And it was important to me to write about both instances. So, you know, this, the chapter or the the story that's in the anthology is from my book Cleanness and in Cleanness, there is this story in which the technology goes very wrong. And then there is another story in which it goes very right. And it was important to me to have both sides. In some early responses from readers to kink, they were really disturbed by that aspect of the anthology and my story in particular, because it, because it involves a, a consent violation. And you know, there's a way in which, as we talk about kink communities, you know, I do want to emphasize the extent to which responsibility and caretaking um, and a kind of ethical, answerable relationship to the other is, is really important in responsible kink communities. I don't write fiction about people who are making really good choices. You know, I don't write fiction about people who know how to take care of themselves and everything goes well. So it's true in my story, you know, this is not someone who um, is in a place where he can take care of himself or he's in a place where he doesn't want to take care of himself, where he wants to be nothing. And so, you know, something that is a kind of fine line I've been finding and I find myself kind of uncomfortably trying to tread it where on one hand, you know, I want to speak about um, kink communities in a way that honors, you know, a, a kind of extraordinary ethic within those communities. 
And yet I also want to um, preserve the right of fiction to explore dark, uncomfortable, irresponsible, disastrous places. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't want anyone to read my story and feel that it's that that it reflects um, or that it contradicts or denies the existence of, you know, responsible practices within King communities. I would uh, just add that, like, <clears throat> it's interesting to me to have my story in this anthology because my story has been anthologized twice before in two other contexts where. Um, or attempts by the editors to, uh, to bring together a group of literary writers um, in an anthology writing about sex. And the first one was Best Gay Erotica 2006. And the second was uh, Best American Erotica 2007. The first editor was Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. Uh, the second editor was Susie Bright. Um, you know, there's like this, for me, there's like this uh, history of publishing and, and the way people approach uh, these kinds of stories and the way they're willing to package them and consume them that I see now when I look at this story in this new anthology. Um, uh, and so it's interesting to think about um, how much or how little people are willing to uh, to read stories about sex and in what kind of context, what sort of context they feel like they need to have permission just to read the story, much less to participate in any of the things that we're writing about. You know, um, and I hope uh, that the anthology helps people who are curious uh, about these things to, to think about them uh, and surprise themselves. Um, uh, but I don't, I also, I don't really feel like an expert. I just feel like, uh, like an old horse <laughs> at a new plow um, in this context. So, uh, so that's, I don't know if that's an answer to the question. But anyway. That's definitely an answer. <laughs> Um, we have so many amazing audience questions, but I do, I did want to bring up one last point um, that when you look at the authors on the front cover, it's like this wonderful kaleidoscope of different ethnicities and identities and sexualities and backgrounds. Um, and I was wondering, is that, was that especially important to you, Reese and Garth, um, when putting this together? And if you can talk about how diverse representation is so important, not only in publishing, um, because as we know, I mean, you know, white men ruled most industries, but up until very recently, definitely the publishing industry. Um, and, and in publishing a book like this one that is about kind of an underground community or, or a community that we think of as like outside of um, this like very typical society that we live in. Um, and I just, I, I just love how diverse it is and I really wanna draw attention to that. Um. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that, Brittany. Um, I'll say that just in general, any anything that I'm involved in spearheading, um, I have a pretty hard rule for myself that I never want there to be more white people um, than not. I never want there to be, or no, yeah, I never want, I always want more people of color than not, more queer people than not, and more marginalized genders than not. Um, I feel as though that's something I can do and in the communities I'm in, it's like actually like relatively, not easy, but it's 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 something that I can that I can that I can always do. Um, I will say that with the book centered on kink, it maybe felt even more important that the that the book be as as inclusive as possible. And of course, we couldn't do everything. Um, we couldn't include everything in there. It's only one book, but there are so many ways in which kink is still considered to be um, for white people, and so much so that we have an event coming up next week with um, Green Apple, and we're partnering with Kink.com, and we're going to have. Um, sex educators and performers, and it's gonna be so awesome. Um, but one of the like points we have, cause we have bullet points about like things we wanna say, because like, yes, it'll be fun and sexy, and, and I'm, like, but it's also gonna be educational. And one of the bullet points is quite literally, people of color are kinky too. Like this is, this can be news to people. Um, and so it felt very important with this book that we, that we show that. <laughs> Yeah, and I love that there are there are queer writers in this, trans writers. Um, I mean, I I just love the representation, um, and 
I will drop a link. Um, I'll email everyone a link to that uh, event next week because I know I will be there because that looks amazing. So you guys can get your double dose of of kink. Um, okay, I want to get to some of these audience questions because some of these are just really great. I don't even know where to start. Um, well, here's a good one. This first question by Audrey. Um, she says, how do you deal with your internal sensor when writing kink? Or do you have an internal sensor? <laughs> it's probably a better question. I think I've murdered my internal sensor. <laughs> my internal sensor is dead and lying on a floor somewhere covered in blood. Um, you know, it's so funny. Actually, it's funny that I'm doing this event with Alex because one of the earliest sort of memories I have of, of trying to like figure out what I wanted my career to look like was actually when I was at Iowa and in Alex's workshop. And re I had read that um, Alex had published work in like a like best gay erotica, like in, and so I, um, and I was in the process of like writing an erotic story that I wanted to submit to like a contest. And I, I like met with Alex and was like, I have a lot of questions. And it was just like, what you do and how you do this and like where this go, you know? And we had this like really wonderful conversation. And I felt like it really gave me this space to like sort of have a conversation, like what kind of career did I want to have? What kind of life as a writer did I want to, did I, you know, and was it important to me to be able to write about sex in this very like forthright, I mean, not just kink, but like sex in general, like in this very sort of direct and like, you know, not euphemistic and not like soaking in, in irony, like this, this really true way. Um, and I felt like, it, yeah, it was like the first time that I ever had really like articulated that to somebody who then gave me advice and, and yeah. And then it became kind of just like a thing like a bit I committed to, but not a bit at all. Like I was just like, all right, this is my thing. Like I might not get some jobs because of this. Like I might not get asked to do certain stuff, but like it's more important to me to like make this happen. And then now I feel like, you know, I mean, and then I remember like first time I read like Garth's first book, I was just like, oh my God, like this is this is what I want. Like this is what I've been looking for. And I'm so glad that like to see like other contempt like look like, at the other writers who are doing this in, the, in this moment. And I don't know, I feel like that's been such a such a really magical process. And I'm really glad that I like made that choice. Like I made that decision at, at an early stage when I was ready to just like, I was like, all right, I'm committing and I, there's no going back. Like, I'm just going to do it. Um, so. <laughs> My God, I'm so moved that you brought that, that conference up. I haven't thought about that in so long. I kind of almost forgot that we had that conversation. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, you know, it's, I guess that's what it brings home to me is how, you know, when I applied to Iowa myself, like in the 90s, I applied with sexually explicit material. Uh, and, you know, I had people who were like, oh, you, you might not get in if you do that. And I was just like, you know what, I don't want to go anywhere if they're not going to take me knowing that I write like this. So... And that was the commitment I made. And, I, and much as you said, Carmen, it was like, there's gonna be jobs I won't get. There's gonna be things that will slip me by, but I just, I have to live like this and, uh, and write like this. And so, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I feel like writing about, uh, writing about life without writing about sex, writing about queer sex, writing about kink is like trying to write about the world but only the land and not the ocean. Like it's just like missing so much of what you would be able to talk about. I love that. That's awesome. Um, Carmen, Maybe you- can... um, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, no, go ahead, Reese. Go, go. I was just, I was gonna speak up for the terrified people because um, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> because I am like the most, like I'm like wrapped with shame and guilt about everything. Um, and at the same time, I also know um, that when I work, when I'm working on something that's terrifying me, um, I know that there's energy there. Like I'm not bored if I'm terrified, um, and I know to I know to like walk toward fear almost. Um, and so and so that combination of things means that like before this book came out, I was having like daily panic attacks for like a solid week. Like I was wondering, I was having these thoughts like. Am I bringing shame upon all Koreans by publishing a book centered on kink? Like that was a question that came up in my head. And I was like, I didn't even know I, I, I believed myself to be capable of bringing shame down upon all Koreans. Like there's so many Koreans. Um, anyway, so something that really helps me with the terror is just saying out loud to myself over and over again, no one needs to see this when I'm working. Um, and I say, and I say that even as I'm working on a book that I, that I know I'm going to send my editor, you know, but if I just say that to myself, it's okay. No one has to see this. No one has to see this. And 
that frees up space for me to write as though no one's going to see it. And it probably, well, I would think it would make it easier because it's fiction, right? So you can always say like, it, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carmen, you kind of touched on this um, when you answered the last question. An anonymous attendee says, how can we write about kink in a way that doesn't come off as fake literary risk? What kind of strategies do y'all use to show it as a real human experience, not just a thing you're exploring to make your work interesting? And I think also a lot of times um, it can come off as corny or contrived or over the top. Right, I feel like there's got to be this very fine line to writing good kink and good sex scenes. Um, and so, how do you do it? <laughs> um, I I guess be interested. Like, is it? I mean, I guess you one can fake interest. I mean, I don't know. I feel like. I can't give you advice if you're just, if you have no interest in anything, but I feel like it's like the, like for me, like when I write about sex, it feels like I'm like accessing some sort of true thing, even a thing that hasn't explicitly happened to me. Like there, you know, and I feel like that's just the process of describing writing fiction where it's like, you're making stuff up, but also you're accessing, like you're accessing these sort of like places of truth inside of you, even when you're writing about things that haven't happened to you. Um, so I don't know, but I feel like for me it also, and also I feel like, thinking, I feel like something's also like a trap people fall into is they, they imagine like, oh, if I'm going to be writing about sex, like it has to be um, like quick, or it has to be uh, like, I have to sort of make it kind of a joke or the sex has to go very badly. Like, you know, so that nobody thinks that I'm too into this thing that I'm doing. Um, but also I think it's okay to be like into the thing that you're writing, um, like to be turned on by something you're writing, I think is actually like fairly normal. Um, and so, yeah, like, I, I think just thinking about it with that level of I mean, earnestness is not quite the right word, but that the sort of a, a, a real like commitment to just like, you know, I really want to like write about this and I want to like, I don't know, create like a, a real experience and it feels real to me, um, whether or not it like actually happened, if that makes sense. So yeah, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, it feels a really hard question to answer. <laughs> um, here's a great question <clears throat> by Josh. Uh, Josh says, kink feels commonly pathologized in literature and society, and while it does seem important that the roots of kink are explored, one of the things that I appreciated about these stories was that kink often simply existed in the lives of the characters. I was wondering if that was something that any of you thought about while working on your stories, explaining the psychology of kink versus just allowing it to exist in the story. Well, um, I'll speak just for my story. Um, and in that story, it was it was actually important to me in writing it that um, that I just avoid that I that the story not be interested in causes and etiology. Um, I, I strongly resist that tendency with kink, um, just in life and with my writing. I think the minute we start looking for a cause, we're also looking for a cure. Um, and I am not interested in a cure. A lot of people aren't interested in a cure. And so, yeah, that, that was a priority. That said, of course, sometimes, sometimes trauma is involved. Sometimes it is a way of, um, of working with trauma, but so is everything else. Like there's, yeah, <laughs> that was of great importance to me, at least with the, with the story. Okay, there's so many good questions. Oh my gosh, you guys are killing it. Um, oh, here's one from Christopher. What recommendations do you have for queer writers who sometimes feel like their writing is not queer enough? I know this is such a silly way to frame it, but it's rough out here, thank you. What does it mean for something to not be queer enough? I guess I feel like if you're, if you're a queer writer, I mean, I feel like queerness is so, like, I feel like I've read books where like, there's been almost no, there's been no explicit discussion of sexual identity. And yet I've been like, this is the queerest thing I've ever read in my entire life. And I feel like that's just like an energy that you can bring to, to work, even if you're not like explicitly asking questions about identity or, or sexuality. Um, 
but I, that, that is not a helpful answer. <laughs> Just like be gay and right. I don't know. I, I feel like one time, I, one time I did an event where somebody was saying to me, like someone said to me, I love your stories because it's like, sometimes you're gay and a ghost appears. And I was like, yeah. And those things don't have to be connected. Like you could just be a gay person. And also there's ghosts and like, you know, those things can exist simultaneously. So I feel like there's just like, yeah, like, like for you, it's like, what is it? If you are a queer person and you have like concerns about things that you want to write about, like that makes those concerns queer, right? Cause you, that you're bringing that to the, to the work. Yeah, I think um, the, the, something to ask yourself, if you, if you feel that is maybe to ask yourself, like, who are you comparing yourself to? Um, if other people say that to you, you might want to ask yourself who they're comparing you to. Um, I, you know, the, that kind of bar is, is, is a, it, it seems like a, a strange, almost like a no win merry-go-round to put yourself and your work on. And I would just try to like, try to, try to take yourself off of that, uh, that sort of scale if you can um, and start thinking about like, instead maybe the question to ask yourself is like, am I writing what I really wanna be writing about or am I writing something that I think looks like a story? Like writing something that I think other people want from me as opposed to what I want from me. That's great advice. Um, James says, thank you for this anthology. What are the artistic touchstones, fiction, poetry, art, film, otherwise, that helped you as a writer come to terms with sex or kink in both your writing and your life? Well, Aro and I did a list for Lit Hub with some of our sort of touchstones. So I can kind of direct you there for ours. And I am excited to take notes on what Carmen and Alex have to say. Uh, Carmen, go for it. No, no, no. I was, I'm also just like thinking, I'm like, all my okay. answers are so strange. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, the like, uh, I remember in New York City, one of the things that you could count on for so long were those uh, street vendor tables covered in old porno mags that people would be selling for like a dollar, three dollars, sometimes more. Um, sometimes there would be like plastic wrap around them. Uh, sometimes they had seen many fingers. Um, uh, and there was always something like, incredible about these tables to me that and in the 80s and 90s um, I would just kind of gawk uh, and then gradually browse because um, it was right there and of course you know they don't want you reading for very long um, and and you don't really want to be uh, you know necessarily maybe you do who knows maybe that's maybe reading porn in public is your thing who knows um, but that was, the, I think of those tables as like a, a serious teacher for me. It was, it's been interesting to me to see, uh, you know, I remember actually I found a review of my uh, first novel that was in the Bay Area Reporter. And I think I texted it to Garth and Brandon because it was like, it was next to like a phone sex ad and like a sex club ad. And it was just like such a great reminder of, of how um, there was this kind of interconnected ecosystem that included these kinds of outlets and, and this sort of nature and this way in which those queer publications were reviewing our serious art and music at a time when it wasn't guaranteed that uh, other outlets would. So, um, so those are some of a few. And then also, I, th I think everyone should read Angela Carter's The Saudian Woman. Um, so Carmen. I feel like my answer is so, I, I'm just sitting here thinking. So like, I, I feel like when I was like younger, like there were a lot of like proto texts that were like 
as it turns out, very kinky and formative in that way. But of course, at the time, I didn't realize it. So like, I was just thinking about like the first time I saw Labyrinth. And I remember there's like this line at the end where David Bowie says like, worship me and I will be your slave. And he's like having this, there's sort of this whole monologue he has about like Sarah. And I remember being like, I like this and I don't know why. <laughs> um, and, or like a uh, legend with Tim Curry, which is like Tim Curry plays like the, this giant like Satan devil man who's like huge and, and he has has this very just like dummy relationship with uh, Mia Sarah and like there's just and I and I and I you know at the time I was just like I like this so much I'm just gonna keep watching it and like you know that was that experience and then I remember being in college and I I went to a um a it was the gay like the gay student organizations the book swap and I I didn't know anybody and I was like very newly out and I didn't know anyone uh who would be at this at this thing so I just like went to the book swap and I like awkwardly sort of walked around for a while and then I saw a book that was like it's called best bisexual erotica and it was easily from like I probably from like the early 90s and I like grabbed it and I ran out of the room and for a long time it was like the only like sexually explicit thing that I had ever read um as an adult um and then of course when I got to grad school and I was lucky enough you'll be like oh you need to read like this and you need to read that and like giving me like yeah giving me Angela Carter and giving me like Nichols like Nicholson Baker and like all these writers who's like work about sex I thought I found very interesting um but I do feel like even before that, like even those just weird moments of like things where you're like, this is, and you don't have the language for it, you know, when you're really young and yeah. So for me, it was like a lot of th like fantasy as it turns out like eighties fantasy movies. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, all right. I will end with this question. Wait, is she frozen for everybody else? <laughs> frozen, <yeah. laughs> oh no! Oh, Brittany, no. you're frozen. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> what is the final question? What Will we ever know? Such a you know what? Dramatic. At the oh, oh, you're back. Come on, you're back. <laughs> I froze on a cliffhanger. <laughs> and a hair toss. <laughs> yeah. I'm back. All right. This is very important last question is from Molly. How do you see kink in the time of the pandemic? Mm. People have so many really creative. Yeah. Yeah. You can't meet in person. It's, it's not safe, you know? So I feel like you have to be very creative. A friend in Italy said that uh, people who are having affairs had started meeting in the lines at supermarkets so they could at least see each other. Oh in person which was so uh I was like wow um uh yeah I think uh what there's there's so many there's so many uh electronic out I mean a lot of creativity was already at use I do remember also like uh the there were um people who had uh uh, medical uh, equipment fetishes who are just were the first people to have like lots of masks <laughs> on hand to share with other people and immediately like sent out um, uh, extra supplies where they were needed. Uh, that was like a, a beautiful moment to me, sort of like when uh, the courtesans in Paris like took in the wounded during the siege of Paris. Like um, uh, it's, yeah, it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think about this a lot. I mean, as someone whose erotic life to a very great extent depends on the free circulation of bodies, um, <laughs> you know, to sort of have that shut down. And, you know, until the last few years when, you know, I've been living with someone else, I mean, my whole life I was alone. And so many of my friends are alone and just, you know, the um, pressure that puts and, you know, this kind of crisis, I think, of loneliness and of just um, like touch starvation mm -hmm. is something that um, I think about a lot. My heart goes out to sort of everyone who, you know, like if it, at any other time in my life, like this would have been an entire year without hugging someone, you know, like it's just, um, I mean, that's devastating, you know. 
And it's true that, you know, I mean, this book was almost entirely put together before the pandemic struck. Um, and yet the meaning of it for me, the way it feels has radically changed because this is a year in which the meaning of touch has changed so radically and in which there's so much less touch. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's hard. I don't have an argument to make about that, but just that there's an affective change. It is a different book for me now um, than it was, you know, for the first two years we were working on it. Well, readers can live vicariously through these characters because there's a lot of touching in this book. <laughs> so they can get their fill until everyone is vaccinated and it's safe again. Um, thank you all so much. You're all literary heroes of mine and I, I cannot think of a better way to spend a Friday night. Um, and this was just so lovely. And like I said to everyone, get your book now because it is selling out everywhere already. It's, it's going to go into multiple printings. It's, it's such an incredible collection. Um, and I think that it's gonna inspire a lot of people. And I, I hope that it, it comforts a lot of people who maybe have these desires, but are scared of them or are ashamed of them or have been taught to be ashamed of them. Um, and so I love that you have, you have this community that is so um, accepting. And I, I just think this is incredible. Thank you so much. This has been such a joy. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank yeah, thank you, everybody. Oh, my God. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone. I so wish that this were live so we could go out to a bar afterwards. But we'll oh, my God, another yes. Another time. Another okay, time. Keep sequel. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all come to DC and we'll go to Comet Ping Pong and have a beer after. All right, it's a date. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Stay well, stay well read, and have an amazing weekend. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.